to be mastered. A double play combination sometimes takes years to develop, so Cash and Boa set out to make up for lost time. The timing got tighter, and things started falling into place. I think there's, I think there's a better attitude on the ball club and a better, you know, better outlook on the thing. I, I think we're. Time to turn things around. On I hope so. Overnight, you know? Yeah, well, we're tired of finishing last, Hank. Hey? Farm director Dallas Green, coaches Ray Ripplemeyer, Billy Demars, Carol Berenger, and Bobby Wine, joined with Ozark and Paul Owens in sensing the promise of spring. Good vibrations were in the air, and the Phillies' next stop was Jack Russell Stadium to bring all the pieces together in the Grapefruit League. Signs of the future are there for those who know how to read them. A sure-handed shortstop with a new attitude. A muscular young third baseman who had found his stroke. A bull named Lozinski who hadn't lost his. But most of all, a new leader. At bat and in the field. Enthusiastic, aggressive, confident. The man who would give this team its personality. Yes, the signs of success were there. Through 10 weeks of training, the squad had been honed to 25, and now those that remained faced the truest test. Time to go north and prove themselves in the 162 game test of Major League Baseball. The season opened with a set lineup. Number 10 at short, number 20 at third, and at second, Dave Cash, who had changed his number to join Boa and Schmidt in the 10, 20, 30 club. But the lessons of spring had not been forgotten. From the very start, the Cash-Boa combination clicked, and a new attitude was born. In an early burst of exuberance, Cash turned to Boa and called out the battle cry for 74. Yes, we can. It articulated the essence of the Cash philosophy, a credo he carried with him every day and soon spread to an entire city. But to work, yes, we can need it some place to start. What better place than the top of the order? In Dave Cash, the Phillies had their most consistent leadoff hitter since Rich Ashburn. The man they called Action Dog knew how to stir things up. With Cash getting on regularly, Boa could look for a chance to display his improving bat control. More and more innings started off with two men on, nobody out. The one-two punch was effective, and in its confident glow, Boa quit sulking and started using his bat to maximum advantage. By putting his raw speed under control, Boa learned to steal bases, 39 in all, the most by a Philly since 1910. Boa's new look was showcased in an early game against the Cubs. He stole second, then third on the next pitch. A fly to center did the rest. This was aggressive, daring, gutty baseball, and Philly fans ate it up. But Yes We Can wasn't limited to one game or one man. 
It engulfed the entire team, and soon everyone was giving it a try. Taking the extra base and laying down the suicide squeeze became part of the master plan. Joining the thundering herd across home plate was Mike Schmidt. Schmidt was out to make amends for 73 and prove himself an all-around athlete. He started the season hitting eighth, just trying to make contact. Quickly, his average jumped over 300, and line drives were rattling the fences. And then the former 198 hitter was moved to the third spot. And the line drives turned to moon shots. Somewhere in spring training, Schmidt had found the key. Now all baseball marveled at the results. Schmidt had arrived as a power hitter, and he put his knockout punch back to back with Greg Luzinski. But the Bulls' home run trot was suddenly cut short. A torn knee ligament brought Luzinski down in June. You don't replace Greg Luzinski with any one man. So the Phils went to several sources to try to pick up the slack. Down on the farm, they found Jay Johnstone playing Philly-style baseball for the Toledo Mud Hens. He made the transition to red pinstripes quite nicely. Johnstone waved an experienced bat. With six years in the American League behind him, he jumped right in and contributed some timely hits. While Johnstone was a new face in town, a more familiar one had also arrived. Tony Taylor had returned to his city, but at 38, Taylor's role was advisor on a team of youth with an occasional pinch-hitting chore in front of his loyal fans. But Taylor's trips turned out to be more than token gestures. The old pro would lead the National League in pinch hits. While Taylor provided standing ovations, another filly was evoking a different response. So far, things had not gone well for Willie Montanez, a man with a very distinctive approach to the game. The trouble started in spring training as trade rumors swirled around first base and number 27's performance reflected his uncertain status. The season opened with Montanez splitting time at first and waiting for something to happen. While he waited, he played the game the only way he knew how, his way. When he's going good, they call Montanez colorful. When things are bad, they yell hot dog. But the trading deadline passed without incident, and Willie's play became very colorful indeed. Swap talk had suddenly ceased, and Montanez celebrated with a 24-game hitting streak, the major league's longest in 74. While John Stone, Taylor, and Montanez signed up for Yes, We Can, their leader was being challenged. Cash's daring over-the-plate stance left him vulnerable, and everybody took their shot. <laughs> Dave 
Dave Cash took his lumps, then got up, dug in, leaned over even more, and the hits just kept whistling out. Everybody chipped in. Tommy Hutton, Del Unser, Mike Anderson, and the runs poured across. On June 3rd, the Phillies took undisputed possession of first place for the first time since 1964. By all-star break, the lead was three games, and the entire 10, 20, 30 club had made the National League squad. Through 95 games, the dream was still alive, and the Phils were halfway home. Over half a season, the Phillies' image had been well-defined, but several trouble spots had appeared. The pitching staff had problems. Even the aces, Steve Calton and Jim Lomborg, were inconsistent. At times, Carlton was the overpowering Cy Young Award winner of 72. At other times, he would go long stretches without victory, putting pressure on a bullpen which couldn't bear the strain. The schizophrenic nature of Philadelphia's pitching staff was best represented by young Dick Ruthven. One time, Ruthven would blow away hitters with the best pure stuff in the National League. The next time off, the smile would vanish as a mistake or missed call would unglue his concentration. Never bad mouth the ump was another lesson learned as Dick Ruthven worked on two different kinds of control. The pitching staff had failed to produce a stopper as the dog days of summer began. July and August test the mettle of a team. Double headers and road trips pile up. Games run together. And you discover it's not always that easy. At times, even boldness backfired as slowly, painfully, Philadelphia lost the lead, then first place. Unable to win two games in a row for over a month, by early September, they were six and a half games back and down to one last chance. Program, fill a yearbook, scorecard line up, let them scorecard. On a perfect night, 30,000 fans turned out as the league-leading Pittsburgh Pirates came to town for a two-game set. <laughs> two victories were a must, and all the enthusiasm of yes, we can would be needed. Get a gang of them. Come on, Bonnie. Yeah. Come on, Mike. Nice and easy. Come on, Ray. Come on, Bonnie. Hey, come on, Andy. You're just going to have to show him the fastball inside so he gives you some respect. Oh. Come on, get in there. Get over his head. Oh. Oh. Yeah, he's just right to hit. We're not, uh, we're not making good contact at all. While Philly bats fell silent, the awesome pirates roared to life. Down four runs in the seventh inning, the Phillies finally got started.
With the game tied at five, a seldom used substitute was called on. A star in 73, number 24, Bill Robinson, had spent a puzzling season battling slumps and riding the bench. Come on, Robbie. Right, well. Watch for a curveball on the first pitch. You know that's what he's going to he start you off with. Hey, come on, buddy. Let's go. Look for it, Gus. He's going to throw that big hook up there, Robbie. Yeah. No, but he's going to start. He's going to start Robbie off with a hook. I know Sang again. Come, come on, Robbie. Look for the hook, babe. Or look yep. for the hook one time. Get it. Get it. Look for the hook. Here comes the breaking stuff. Hit me in the ribs and he goes, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> it was downtown all the way. <laughs> Philadelphia swept the Pirates, but it proved to be no more than a last hurrah. Ball stuck in the wall. The next night, a 17-inning loss to St. Louis would crush the momentum, and the Phils would drop from contention. The dream of spring had ended. But a third place finish and 80 wins marked the finest Philadelphia season in seven years. Respectability had returned, and baseball's best infield emerged. Individually, they each contributed a special dimension. Larry Boa hit for average and drove teams crazy on the base path. Willie Montanez hit and hustled his way to the highest Phillies average since 1967. Mike Schmidt raised his average almost 100 points, drove in 115 runs, and led the major leagues in homers with 36. Tying it all together was the man in the middle. Dave Cash started every game, gathered 206 hits, and provided 1974 with a moral. This was the year that Philadelphia found out what it takes to win.